Bibles with you this morning, open up to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. We'll start reading there, verse 1. When Samuel became old and he made his sons judges over Israel, the name of the firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second son was Abijah. They were judges in Beshira. Yet he, his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and personal justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your way. Now hear for us a king, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. It's good to be here with you today. I am fighting allergies as I have for the last 32 years since I moved to Southeast Texas. So hopefully I can make it through this today. Uh, second of all, I have a tie with my grandkids on it. But any minute now we're expecting a phone call that our sixth grandchild will be born. So if you see my wife sitting right back there, get up and leave, I need to ride home with somebody. <laughs> it's good to be here and it's good to be with you oh if I could just be somebody else have you ever thought about that talk to a few of you today I grew up in New York I was born in Cisco, Texas over near Abilene about 50 miles from Abilene right on Interstate 20 as an eight-year-old boy, my parents picked us up and we moved to New York with the Exodus group that went up there to help strengthen the church. Lived there for 10 years. At 18, when I graduated high school, I got out of New York as quick as I could. And then I got back to Texas as quick as I could also. But growing up in New York in the mid-60s, I love Mickey Mantle. Y'all know who Mickey Mantle is? Young kids don't, some of us old ones do. The Mick. I played baseball all through junior high and high school. And my glove had Mickey Mantle's name on it. My bat had Mickey Mantle's name on it. Everyone else up there loved Mickey Mantle too. I never got the chance to wear number seven. But Mickey Mantle was my hero. If I could hit like he could, if I could run like he could, if I could play baseball like he could, I would have paid the Yankees to let me play. They wouldn't have had to pay me. But you know that I grew up and I found out he was from Oklahoma. He was my hero. I was 35 years old when I started preaching. I heard a sermon one day, there is a need for good sound doctrine preachers. And guess what we need today? We need more good sound doctrine preachers. When we look at the churches of Christ in America, the last polls I heard, there were around 10,000 of the Lord's church here. And only 5,000 of them have their pulpits filled. We need good, sound doctrine preachers. We need people to look up to sound doctrine preachers. 
I was very fortunate when I decided to go back to school and get my Bible degree. I, I heard of that lesson. My wife had always told me that she didn't want to be married to a preacher. I said, don't worry, I'll never be one. Some people say I haven't lied to her yet. <laughs> but after about two weeks, both of us thinking that we would like to do something like this, but realizing what the other person had said, we finally talked. And I was able to go back to school. Get my Bible degree. I don't know how many of you know Dan Winkler. Dan Winkler was a preacher at Bell Nine Road Church, Church of Christ in Decatur, Alabama. They helped support Sheila and I as we went through the college. And Dan told me, he said, Tony, anytime you need to use my library. It's here for you. And there were many times that I went in and sat down with Dan, talked with him. And I remember thinking as I was going through school, if I could only preach like Dan Winkler. I started preaching. And I came to the realization that I won't ever preach like then. But that's not what God wants me to preach like anyway. God wants me to preach like me. He wants me to do the very best that I can. That's all God asks out of any of us. Do the best. Live the best you can. thought about the leaders of Israel going to Samuel. And they said, Samuel, we want you to make us a king. We want you to find somebody and instead of having judges, we want to have a king. And what was their reasoning behind wanting to have a king? Because they wanted to be like Everybody else. And you know, there's a danger in being like everybody else, isn't there? Especially if the everybody else's are not Christians. And that's the trouble that we're having in the church today. That we are wanting to be like everybody else and our congregations or turning farther away from God. Samuel was upset. And he went to God and said, these people want to have a king. And God said, you give them what they want. He said, but I want you to remember one thing. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They were rejecting God. And brothers and sisters, today, when we're searching and trying to be like everybody else, what are we doing? We're rejecting God. And we see it so often in the churches today, don't we? We see it so often in the churches. But we see it so often in the Bible too, don't we? Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, Satan comes to Eve and says, Eve, did God really tell you you could eat of all the trees in the garden? And Eve said, all but the one right in the middle of, the middle of it. Said we couldn't touch it or eat of it. And Satan says, you know, it's okay. Because God just don't want you to be as smart as him and have the wisdom that he has. What was he saying to Eve? Be like God, eat of it. And she ate of it. And she gave it to Adam and Adam ate of it.
sin came into the world. And it hasn't left yet, has it? It hasn't left yet. How about in Cain and Abel? Genesis 4, verse 5. God had told them what kind of sacrifice to, to give to him. Abel, he, he, he said, was good. He accepted it. Cain, he said, I don't accept. Why? Because Cain had rejected what he had told him. He had rejected the words of God. Then he got so mad he killed his brother. Do we ever get mad at ourselves when we fall? I pray that we don't kill our brothers when we do. They that right by who look in Leviticus chapter. We're offering unauthorized fire. They rejected God, gave it another type of fire, unauthorized. And the fire destroyed the two of them. We can look at Israel over and over and over again. They're being led out of the land of Egypt. God shows them ten signs. This is my power. Finally, they get left free. They get to the Red Sea. They turn around. They see the Egyptian army coming at them. What do they say? Why did you bring us out here to die? They had forgotten the power of God. They had forgotten the strength of God. And what were they doing? They were rejecting him and saying, why did you bring us out here? We had all we needed back in Egypt. God parted that red sea. They all walked across a dry land. The last one stepped foot on the other side of the water's closed. The whole Egyptian army was drowned. Now they've seen God's power 11 times. And then they get to the Jordan River. There's a promised land right, right across. They can look over and see it. But they still lack their faith. Still lack faith to do what God had said. They rejected it. And so they went out into the wilderness for 40 years. Everyone 20 and above died in the wilderness. So there was a new generation, a new people that was going to come back and inherit what these others did. Because they were rejecting doing what God had told them to. And what were they doing? They were turning to someone else. They weren't turning to God. They were turning to themselves. And you know, that's the big problem we have, don't we? Is we expect that we can do it ourselves. Kind of like the first time I was asked to substitute teach in Coos, Texas. Answered the phone that morning. Told them I'd be glad to do it. I hung up. My wife said, who are you subbing for? And I told her, she just started shaking her head. She said, that's the worst class in the whole school. So I got there that morning, the bell rang, the kids came in, the announcements were over. I was standing right in the middle of the classroom. I said, my name is Mr. Fitzgerald. I'm big, I'm tall, I'm fat, I'm ugly, and I'm mean. So you better do what I say. They were little angels all day.
if we would just do what God tells us to do. The way that he tells us to do it. And have the faith that even though the other people are bigger, fatter and uglier, meaner, God's still going to take care of us, isn't he? Stop looking to ourselves and look to God. Stop saying, I want to be like somebody else, but be like God. If we look at, at all of the prophets, and the major prophets, minor prophets, all through there, you see that the people rejected God. And that's why God was sending the prophets to warn them about their destruction. we turn to? What do we do? God says he wants us to hear his word and keep his law. Jeremiah 6, 19, it says that the people were not doing that. But that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to hear his word. He wants us to follow his law. I've listed a couple of areas in groups that have been hurtful to the church. And ones that we must look out for. And they were all started because somebody wanted to do what somebody else was doing. First group was Crossroads. I don't know if y'all remember Crossroads. I have a view of Crossroads from the outside. I don't have a view of Crossroads from the inside. Because I never did get into it as much as they tried to pull me in. Kip McKean, who when Crossroads broke, broke it, broke up, began uh, the Boston Movement. He was a campus minister at the junior college I went to. First day of, of school, he came up to me, what's your name? I told him, he looked at his paper, he said, okay, your prayer partner is Mike Peterson. I said, what does that mean? That means you need to meet with him two or three times a week and talk to him about struggles you're having and pray together. You know what? That was a, a good idea. But I had a whole lot of better friends than Mike Peterson that I could sit and talk to and just bore my heart out. Mike, I imagine, would have smiled the whole time I was doing it. My other friends would have cried with me. But the whole idea of Crossroads was, in the beginning, was good. Let's go out to the college campuses. Let's reach out to the people there who are homesick, who don't have any friends, and show them the love of God. The love of God needs to be shown to everybody, doesn't it? And if we don't show it, who's going to show it? But it was very good until they got to the point where they said, all right, now we have rules for you. Again, what I heard was from people who I know were in it. People at the junior college that, that I went to who had a hard time getting out of it. But they would come and they would talk and they would say, you know, what all they had to do. And it was no longer you're hurting God, you're hurting your disciple. The disciple was the head guy with a prayer partner. You know, he had 10 or 12 prayer partners under him. And when you left after meeting with him, he took notes. 
everything that you had said. And every few nights, all these disciples would get together and they would go over in front of everybody what other people were struggling about. And then they would all come talk to you, tell you how bad you were. Kip kept on asking me, have you met with your prayer partner? And I kept on saying, no. You got to remember at this time, I was not a preacher. Remember what I told Sheila when we were dating? I would never be a preacher. That was my days. And finally one day, Kip came up to me and looked at me and said, Tony, you're going to hell. I said, Kip, I guess you'll be there with me, won't you? He didn't come to me anymore after. When the crossroad elder finally stood up and asked for forgiveness for what Crossroads had, had done in 1991, I believe that was, Kip McKean took the reins and the Boston movement started. I have watched newsreels from Boston, Massachusetts, that was on the nightly news. And they, at the beginning of each one of them, they said, we are not talking about the mainline Church of Christ. We're talking about a cult with this Boston movement. Muddy in the water. That's what some lawyers do. They muddy in the water. They had already muddied the water when they said churches of Christ. And so this was throwing all of us into, into this. Kim McKean later. My mother would say he got too big for his riches. And he started the International Churches of Christ. Just a few years ago, that fell apart. But even though, even though the whole group has fallen apart, the little cells still remain. I know of one in the eastern part of Pennsylvania that are still going around trying to use these tactics. Another group that we need to be careful for is the community of faith. You all heard of them. We're the community of faith. All you have to do is believe in God. You believe in God and, and if you're in. What are young people listening to today? There's a religious group that meets about three or four miles down MLK from South Park. And their big billboard out in front of them, their building says, no more boring church. I didn't realize church was boring, did you? When I come to worship God, he's here in my presence. How can that be boring? But our young people are listening to it. Our young people are dating people from other religions. And they're falling in love. And neither one of them want to go to the religious group that the other one's going to. So let's go to the community of faith. They accept us all. I know of three youth groups in this area in the last 10 years that we've lost because of them. God's good. If you love him, he, God's a loving God. He's not sending anybody to hell. Does your Bible still talk about hell? Mine does. But these are things that we're facing here. Young people are saying, 
I want to be like that group. I want to be like him. I want to be like her. What are we doing? What are we teaching? We need to be teaching this to our young people. We need to be. I've been the director of the Church of Christ Student Center for 22 years as well as a preacher of South Park. I see it all the time. I struggle with the kids and trying to teach them what's right. Yeah, but this group over here, they say it's okay. I said, but the Bible doesn't. And I show them in the Bible. Well, it's okay. They said it. Last group I want to talk about is the newest one that I know of. And some of y'all probably have already heard of the Ashbury University. Guess where that's heading? All over the world. A month ago, two people came into my office and said, we want to bring it here. I want to bring it here. I wouldn't say anything at all to my students about it. We're not going to follow somebody else. And we're not going to be just hyped up and, and ready to go. We're going to follow God. At least that's what I'm going to teach them. Don't follow somebody else. Don't be like somebody else. Be what God wants you to be. Do what God wants you to do. Samuel allowed the people to have a king. And then he gave them a warning, starting in verse 10, the first Samuel chapter 8. So Samuel told all of the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king for him. He said, these will be the ways of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariot. And he will be his horseman, and to run before the chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, and commanders of fifty, and some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to performers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and all of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of all your flocks. That they will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for, the, for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you. Jesus did not have the right to teach his own words, what gives me the right? What gives someone else the right? 
that are taking our young people away. Romans 12 and 2, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Be transformed into God's people. Bible tells us we're to be peculiar people. What does that mean? But you want to see peculiar? Come over to Lamar sometime in the regular semester. We we're about to have graduation next weekend. But see these people walking by. Yeah, you know, I used to say that God don't want us to have pink and yellow and orange hair. That's not what this peculiar means. But that's what you see walking around today. God wants us to be different in our actions. God wants you and God wants me to be a Christian. Brothers and sisters, do the will of God, your Father. 